Good morning, brothers and sisters. This is Pastor Lee. You will not find any videos of myself during these lectures. Why? Because it is not about me, but the focus should be on the gospel. We hope that you had a good week, and I hope you are wearing your mask and social distancing during this crisis. Once again, we thank you for tuning in to the Pastor.Faith YouTube channel. We are bringing you messages using the manuscripts which were the original writings and interpretation into the King James Bible. This will give each and every one of us a clear view and understanding of the Bible which was created with the wisdom of God to teach with clarity and understanding, not to confuse. As we look at the book of James chapter one, verse five through six, it teaches us if any lack wisdom, let him ask of the Lord who giveth to all men and women freely. So go with us now into another lecture where some are recorded live and some come directly from the desk of the pastor. Come follow us with your Bibles as we follow Christ. Okay, all right. Again, the title of this message is Three Kinds of Deaths. And a lot of us need to be clearer about what happens uh, life after death. And that is life after death of the physical body. And, you know, me growing up as a child, I always wrestled with death, always. You know, I would look up in heaven, and I can remember as a kid, eight years old, and just wondering, you know, what happens to me when I die? Are you up there? Am I coming to see you? Or what's going on? You know, or when my parents mention a funeral, I'm like, so where's Joe at? You know, is he in that body? Because I was thinking when I walk up to, uh, during their uh, wake or a funeral, I would look in there and go to myself, are you in there, Joe? Can you hear us, Joe? And I don't really believe that there should be confusing confusion about life after death. And I think that helps us to prepare to live this life, knowing where we're going, what we're doing, based on the decisions that we made off of the Word of God. So, so let us look at the, nat the nature of life, which is the ending in physical death, where all uh, our lives are going to end with physical death. There was only a... Uh, what was it? Three people in the Bible that God took and they went to heaven with him. And we all are targeted to live out our lives and die. And God had reasons for why he took uh, the, the, the three, uh, what was it, two prophets and, uh, well, actually three prophets. Moses was a prophet, Elijah was a prophet, uh, Enoch was a prophet and there, there was reasoning why God took them. One of the reasons is that if people knew where they were, what they were, where they were buried, that they would worship them more than God. That would be their worshiping. And that's why people have tried to find Moses' body because they would have worshiped him and, rather than God. At death, the spirit and soul leaves the body. Death is not an annihilation, but the separation of the spirit from the body. James chapter 2, 26, we are told, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. We can't see it. We're, we believe in things that we are not sure of, but through faith we believe that it is true through the Word of God. 
Let me make this statement. Although God's word distinguishes between soul and spirit, it never separates them either in life or death. Everyone say life or death. It is the spirit that thinks, reasons, understands, whereas the soul expresses emotions. This is why the spirit and soul are so closely connected together. Hebrews chapter 4, 12, verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. That's way down inside and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, which is the mind. So when you hear someone talk about the heart, the heart, did you give your heart to God? Did you give your heart? They're really talking about the mind because all the heart is doing, it's going. But the mind is actually hearing, seeing, and discerning. That's the mind. And that's what Satan tries to, is his motive is to attack and try to destroy. The Bible describes death as a separation. The death, the death is a separation of soul, spirit from the body. Elijah prayed that the son of the widow of, of Seraphith might be restored to life. As we look at uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 20 through 22. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, that thou hast, thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn. Now if we remember, her son had a stroke. And Elijah was boarding with uh, this lady and living there until God said differently. And when this happened, she brought her son to him. And, and said, uh, if you read into the word of God, it's going to tell you. He said, uh, she said to him, what have thou done to me? You've come to me. And then has the Lord brought a curse upon my child by slaying my son. And he stretched himself upon the, the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord, my God. I pray thee, let this child's soul come unto him again. And Elijah was praying. He knew who to pray to. He knew who would give the final answer. And the Bible says, And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came unto him again, and he was revived. Now here Elijah prays that the child's soul and spirit might re-enter the lifeless body, and in, a, and in answer to the prayer, the soul and the spirit of the child came unto him again, and he revived. And this clearly shows that the soul had departed, the soul and the spirit had departed, and that the death is a separation of the soul and spirit from the body. When the ruler's daughter was raised in life, Luke 8, 49, 55 through 55. It is said, and her spirit and soul came again. She rose straightway, implying that in dying, her spirit and soul had left the body and would have to return again before it could be restored to life. No language could make it more clear that death is a separation of the spirit and soul from the body. Let me repeat again, physical death is not the end of existence. Death in the Bible always means separation, separation. Everyone say separation. The political son was separated from his father and from his father's house uh, consequently. The father said, this is my son that was dead and is alive again. That was, that's in Luke 15, 24. This is a different uh, example. For this my son was dead and is alive again, and he was lost and is found. And they began to be married. 
Now the father did not mean that his son had ceased to exist, but that he was separated from him, body, soul, spirit, in a far country. The whole shabam was gone because he decided he wanted to be out on his own. Now let's look briefly at the three kinds of death referred to in the word of God. Listen closely. Physical death, spiritual death, and eternal death. Physical death is separation of the soul spirit from the body. In James 2.26, we are told the body without the spirit is dead. Period. Number two, the spiritual death simply means separation from God. Ephesians 2 1 Paul writes and told the Ephesians you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins and that is the Spirit of God quickening in them and coming into them first Timothy 5 6 Paul wrote to Timothy she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth he was speaking her not having God's Spirit within her Soul, spirit, and body, which means no identification with God. So you can have, you cannot have uh, God's spirit within your spirit and soul and the body. And if you don't have it, then you don't have God in you, within you. And that was the difference of the illustration that he was given with this the woman. It could be a woman, it could be anybody that, that don't have Christ and just living life pleasurely, enjoying life, whatever. But God's spirit is not on board because they didn't invite him into their life and repent of their sins. And receive him as Lord and Savior. Now when we look at eternal death. Found in Revelations 21 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable murderers, whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The spirit and soul, this is eternal separation from God and from all that is good and desirable together due to non-acknowledgement of Jesus Christ as Savior with an everlasting punishment as the result of the final judgment. Now, when we look at eternal death, we're talking about when the millennium comes. There's going to be a thousand years of teaching. God's going to give people another opportunity to hear the word and hear the truth just as it was in the first earth age. And you hear me talk about that? And I know some of you are like, what, what, when, where, how? You can't get away from the first earth age because why, what happened in the first earth age? Satan went against God Almighty. Though God raised him, if you read in the word, Ezekiel 28 tells you about how God made him the full pattern to go forth and do that which was right. And Satan grew in ranks. He grew to be a cherubim to guard the mercy seat which Christ would set on. And he saw himself to be so great and so luscious that he decided he wanted to be God. And that's when he convinced a third of God's creation to go up against him. Okay? And it's another sermon for another time about the third uh, coming, uh, God sending them back here in, body, in bodies. And uh, that's why all the trivia is going on in this earth right now men women being born in the flesh okay getting back to the topic after the thousand year reign when people have been taught the word of god again if you remember satan is going to be locked in a pit during that time so there's not going to be any confusion about right wrong wrong right 
He's locked away, his spirit, everything. No temptation or anything. And after they are taught, because God's motive is one thing. Do you love me more than you love Satan and the works and the temptation of him? And after the thousand year reign, or the thousand year of teaching, then Satan is going to be released. Everyone say released. And he's going to bring his foolishness about again. And the Lord's going to stand back and see who listened to the teachings that was brought to him or to them, I'm sorry. And who could care less? Because the Bible says he's going to convince again a percentage of those that heard and could care less. And they're going to go with him. He's going to convince them we can take God Almighty and the Messiah. We can take him. And they're going to get right on his bandwagon. And they're going to go up to try to take him. And that's when they're going to be destroyed. And they're going to be, that's going to be the eternal death of them. And when it's said here in 21.8, talks about the abomination of murderers, warmongers, or sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, unbelievers, that's still in their heart. It's still in their heart. They heard what, what, the, what was being taught to them in the millennium, but it didn't even phase them. They could care less. All they wanted to do is get back to doing what they were doing. And as soon as Satan appeared, they got right on his bandwagon and started again. But the Bible talks about that they will be annihilated, overdone. And guess what? We that are in heaven knew a lot of these people. God is going to take it from our minds so we don't remember them. Because if we remembered Uncle John or, or, or Aunt Sally, oh my gracious, wonder what's happening to them. Would we be happy in heaven? Not at all. Not at all. And heaven is a place where there won't be any tears and it won't be anybody uh, disgruntled about anything because God's going to take away and destroy all of the, the temptations of that air. Is there consciousness after death? There are a number of false religions which teach that between death and the resurrection, all Christians sleeps bodily, soul, and spirit. And amongst those who teach re the resurrection of, of all Christians sleeps bodily, soul, and spirit, they are false, the false religions. And the false religions teach that when a man dies, he is just like a dead dog or a dead alley cat. They say there is no absolute, no consciousness between death and resurrection. But what does the Bible say? That's the most important thing. God's word clearly teaches that the dead are conscious. And I'm going to produce four uh, uh, examples to prove this. The first witness is the apostle Paul. What does Paul say con concerning death? Are they conscious? Listen, 1 Thessalonians 5.10, whether we awake or sleep, live or die, we live together with him. Which is plain enough, whether we wake or sleep, we live. If we leave the body, we live. If we depart from the world, we live. We live, though the body lies down in the grave, the physical body, the man or woman, the tenant, the tenant of the body, lives on in eternity. Now, the second witness is John. He describes a scene in heaven. Listen to this. Many of you think, I'm sure you have from time to time, those that have served God, where are they? Are they conscious? Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 through 10. And when, this is John, when John, he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar 
the souls of them that were slain for the word of, of God, the martyrs. And for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, doest thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Those that took advantage of us and killed us as we stood up for you. How long, Lord? And here John sees the souls of the martyrs who are on earth, were slain for the word of God. He hears the word, the souls of these martyrs crying out to God. They speak to God. They're speaking to God. There's dialect. And God speaks to them. And John hears the Lord comforting them. And these speak to God constantly. And God speaks to them. And here we see these martyrs died on earth, these bodies filled the martyr graves, and was the end of and, and and this was not the end of them. John tells us their souls are in heaven. He declares they are alive apart from their earthly bodies. They continue to live. <coughs> Excuse me. After physical death. Everyone say they continue to live. The third witness is David, David's child that had died, if you remember that. And he limited him, had the funeral of Ewing, and he asked God to spare him. But God thought it best to take the child unto himself. What did David say? 2 Samuel 12, 23. Listen, I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. David believed that the, souls of his the soul of his child was in the other world, alive, and that he and his father, when he died, would join his little one there. If David had believed that the dead are conscious, unconscious, how could he have spoken of meeting his child after death? Now, as we remember our relatives, some of us were very close to, they can't come back to us. They can't. We have to prepare to go to them, to see them. And if you remember what heaven is, when everyone dies, listen to me, when everyone dies, they go directly in the face of God and they are judged now in heaven it's divided there's a paradise side there's a torment side and those of us that have served Christ we're going on the paradise side those that have not they're on the torment side now when I say torment get it right it's not burning and hollering and screaming when you're on the torment side, it's mental depression of what they did with their life, the choices they made, and what they could have did and could have been on the other side. But the Bible says there's a great gulf fixed in between both sides. They can turn and look and see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, see your mom, your dad over there rejoicing. They're just having a glorified time. But they can't go over there because of the choices that they made in life. Is there consciousness? Yes. Does your conscience beat you up? Yes. On the decisions that was made. The fourth witness is David's greater son. And, it, and I like how, how it, it talks about him. The greater son, Jesus Christ, came through his lineage. There was a cult in, in Christ's day when, uh, when den, who denied the re resurrection and the, and the life beyond. And this group was the Sadducees and said that when a man dies, he utterly perishes and ceases to be. And they said, there is no more life beyond the grave. But our Lord Jesus met these Sadducees one day and took their teachings and exposed it <clears throat> as a monstrosity life. Our Lord said, but as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read 
that which was spoken unto you by God? And you know, it's a funny thing because uh, Jesus used this saying quite a bit in his ministry. And it is, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God? And it's no excuse for you and I. You know, when we want to know something, I said earlier, come to me, I'll be glad to help you. But it, we have a responsibility to get in the word and to search it out and study it. To know for ourselves. And it's why I give scriptures and, and, and different uh, examples, because I want you to go home and I want you to research it. And he says in Matthew 22, 31 through 32, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. The living, the living. Here is the bold, clear statement of Jesus Christ himself that the dead are conscious that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were alive and that very moment, although their bodies had been in the grave for hundreds of years. Now, now let's go to the very exciting uh, example in Luke 16, verse 22 through 23. Our Lord tells of an unbelieving man who died and was buried. Everyone say buried. Was that the end? Did the funeral terminate his existence? Listen to the word of God. The rich man also died and was buried and in Hades torment he lifted up his eyes being in torment. And you know what this tells you and I? Clearly. Everyone say clearly. His name was not written in the Lamb's book of life. He didn't receive Christ as his Lord and Savior. He didn't have time for him. The only thing, you read a story, the only thing he had time for, building buildings, knocking buildings down, bigging, building bigger buildings, putting the stock and uh, food and, and all this other stuff in there because he thought he would never die. How do you know if your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life? To have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life means you have repented, from your sins and accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord before your physical body or while you're in your physical body. You must be born again. To be born again means you die to your old self and allow the Holy Spirit to lead and guide you into a new spiritual creation. And this is not about being perfect. Again, I got to align this statement with that. It doesn't mean about being uh, uh, perfect, but you're having Christ in your life, in your mind. You're thinking about him. You're reading the word. You're trying to, to get better at what you do. And repentance is something we do uh, every day, and sometimes we do it more than, than uh, once a day. Because we want to be found clean before him. If we die, we don't want a pile of sins written down to be waiting upon us when we get to heaven. You ever heard of the robe of righteousness? Does anyone know what the robe of righteousness is? That's where you are covered with a robe. You put on the robe of righteousness. What do they consist of? It consists of the deeds that you've done, the good deeds that you've done. The repentance that you've done. And there's going to be people, yes, that are there with just a robe, with nothing on it. Not no indication of anything. I'm talking about Christians. They're going to be there because they didn't do anything. Or they might have repented and received Christ at the last breath when they're about to die. Lord, I receive you in my heart. I repent of anything that I've done. Well, they just have a robe of righteousness. Nothing on it. But as we go through life, we try to do what's good, we try to do what's right, and as we go through life and we, we repent, we ask for forgiveness to wipe away any of the other things that we slipped up on, should have done, didn't do, and it keeps building up this robe of righteousness that when we stand before the Lord. 
You must be born again. To be born again means you die to your old self little by little and allow the Holy Spirit to lead and guide you into a new spiritual creation. Now, you know, you know what the greatest thing that I love about this truth? And sometimes we don't all get it right away. Sometimes we've got to go through life 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years before we truly understand it. But, you know, there was, there was things that I was doing that I knew that I was struggling with. Lord, I need your help. I need your help. You've got to help me, Lord. You've got to help me, Lord. I'm tired of repenting. You've got to help me, Lord. But I remember the time when I came to my full senses. And I said to the Lord, I'm tired. I'm tired of fighting this battle on my own. I turn it over to you. Do what you got to do. And when I entered that state of mind, God took it just like that. It's when you're serious with him. You know, we try to play co-pilot with God all the time. We do. Yeah, Jesus, help me, help me here. I got the will. And we start, we go back to driving our own lives. But when we clearly, whatever's in your life, turn it over to him and say, I want nothing to do with it, but just help me. Help me in this situation. Could anything be plainer than that? The rich man saw, he felt, remembered, and he suffered, although his body had been buried in the grave. Of course, many people would have us to believe that this passage is not a parable. However, may I call your attention to this. It doesn't make any difference whether it is a saying or whether it is a parable. It is the word of God. It's true. In some instances, God called other people's names and there's other times he didn't. It was a parable with no names. But let us suppose for a moment that this is a parable. It still would, do, would not do away with the truth that our Lord is trying to convey the truth. When you read the word of God, you have got to understand who's writing the word, what the topic is, what the theme is of what is being said in that chapter. That's the most important thing, not trying to find fault with the Lord. Our Lord teaches in this passage, whether parable or fact, everyone say whether parable or fact, that the souls of men are conscience after death, that the unsaved are tormented on the other side of heaven, of paradise, and that the saved are in bliss. What's bliss? perfect happiness we're enjoying ourselves we're having a heavenly party and I'm looking forward to that the fact that the soul lives and is conscious after death is plainly stated in Matthew 10 28 the Lord Jesus said that the soul cannot be killed and fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul He's the only one that can do this. He has all power, not partial power, all power. The body can be killed, but the soul cannot be killed. Killing the body does not kill the soul and the spirit. Certainly the soul and the spirit is alive and conscious after the death of the body. Paul talks in one of his uh, phrases and sayings, he says that absent from the body is the presence of the Lord. You know, I used to think for a long time in life, oh my gracious, that person died. They were in a car crash. Oh, this happened. Oh my gracious, the plane went down. Oh, the torment they must have went through and the pain. Got it all wrong. To be absent from the body is to be in the presence of the Lord. I can trip down these stairs and die and go right on up and be right in the presence of God. It's what I'm waiting for. I say my prayers every day, ask God's protection and blessing upon my life. But you know what? I ain't scared to tell you. 
I look every day for the time that I can leave here and be right in the presence of God. There's nothing here to keep me. Nothing here to keep me. Possessions, nothing. I want to be in the presence of God of peace, tranquility, and just enjoying his presence. No fear, no anguish, or nothing. How many of us have felt that? That's where we want to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, today we honor you and we thank you for your word, which is so powerful every time we read it, every time we listen to it. And I thank you for using me to bring it forth. And today, Father, we just ask you to rest upon our minds today and just allow us to value life on earth and life in your presence. And we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us on the Pastor.Faith YouTube channel. We encourage you to have a conversation with God on a daily basis. Not many people take the time out of their schedule to do so. This ministry encourages everyone to receive Jesus Christ into their life as Lord and Savior. You may ask, how do I receive him? Just talk to him confessing to him as being a sinner and how much you need him. Asking Jesus into your heart, which is your mind, and in doing so, we then have a covenant with God that when we repent and ask forgiveness for any of our sins that we all commit regularly, God is justified to forgive us of our sins. Let me say that the most challenging moment we will face in our life is receiving that forgiveness that God provides. You may not feel comfortable the first time around, but practice makes perfect. Knowing that someone loves you deeply as God Almighty, he himself has proven by bringing his only begotten son to take on our sins as the last sacrifice for mankind to absorb all of the sins of mankind that we all commit and still having the power to forgive us. We love you. Look forward to meeting with you and sharing the next message. Soon as I stopped worrying Worrying how the story ain't I let go and I let God I let God have his way That's when things start happening When I stop looking at back then When I let go and I let God I let God have his way I couldn't seem to fall asleep There was so much on my mind Searching for that peace But the peace I could not find Oh, but then I, I kneeled down to pray I was praying, help me please he said you don't have to cry Cause I'll supply all your needs Soon as I stop worrying oh, Worrying how the story is oh, When I let go and I let God Let God have his way That's
let go. Let go. Oh, let go. Let go. And just let God. Let go. Oh, let go. 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 let go.